last video, video number 10. It is about to get even sadder. I am sorry, but we're nearly there. Good luck. Bye. Harry's feet hardly seemed to touch the ground as he followed Jake, and it was easy to run. He had run through the trees, reached out, and he could almost touch Jake's red fur. George was up ahead, George waving from the top of the hill, and when Harry got there, he could see it all. The land just as it had been forever, untouched. Dark green tracks of forest over hills and mountains and rolling down valleys. Trees as far as he could see, running on and on to snow-capped peaks that lit up the sky. And there was water too, pockets of it and rivers of it, big silent lakes of it. And he could see the ocean now, light blue and dark blue, places where the surface boiled up white and gold. It went on for as far as he could see the whole world. And he thought, I am free, flying like a bird. I am free. Miles was in the orange light that came before darkness, the sun burning brightly before it fell below the earth. He had been drifting for a lifetime and his mind had lost its way. It was dissolving and he had forgotten about Harry, forgotten about all the things that came before. There was only this vastness, the swing of a giant pendulum, water receding, then flooding back, and he was part of it. Part of the deep water, part of the waves, part of the rocks and the reefs along the shore. He sank down in the water, muscles relaxed, no longer fighting, and he dropped away from the light and away from the air. Ready now. Water spewed from his mouth, breathing, breath making him gasp and cough. He was being lifted and carried. His body swayed from side to side, but his eyes were heavy. The world was still and too far out of reach. He was thirsty, so thirsty. His lips cracked and stung. He felt a hand under his head, lifting it up, and something cold touched his, touched his mouth. Water. He swallowed it, but now he felt cold. His body started to shake and to twitch. Pins and needles in his limbs moved down to his hands and his feet ripples of cold and feeling. He cried out and someone touched his head and stroked his hair. He still couldn't see. He heard footsteps, voices, the buzz of lights, and he fell into nothingness again. It was Joe looking down at him. Joe, thank God, he said. His face was weird. It was swollen and blurry and his eyes were thin and almost closed. Miles looked around the room. He looked at the grey walls and the door and at the low white ceiling. Uniform squares with hundreds of uniform holes in each. He was in the hospital. He tried to sit up but his body wouldn't work. Only his head would move. Only his fingers. They stretched out and curled back. He felt the sheet beneath him smooth and crisp and tucked tight. He made a fist and tried to hold it. Joe reached out and touched his arm. I'm sorry, he said. I'm so sorry. Miles opened his mouth to speak, but no sane sound came. His throat was tight. He didn't know what Joe was talking about and how the hand touching his arm was hot and it was burning him. He looked peaceful, Miles. I mean, he was perfect. They found him on one of the reefs out near Acton and he was perfect. Nothing had touched him. Miles closed his eyes and tried to breathe. He was in the water. Harry was in the water. He started screaming. The sound bounced off the walls and off the floor and whipped around the room like a storm, but it didn't feel like it was coming from him. The sound was coming from somewhere else, from somewhere he could see. A boy lying on a bed, a boy that couldn't be him. The sound grew fainter and died away until it was nothing but a whisper. He could barely hear, and he felt heavy and tired then. He felt warm. It was warm in the car and it was snug, with all the bags and clothes packed in around them, and Miles looked at Harry. His eyes were heavy falling into sleep but the car slowed down it stopped and miles couldn't tell where they were where they were on the road because it was so dark he thought he could hear the river but maybe it was just the wind in the trees maybe it was the ocean and the passenger door opened and someone got in a man ready he said and miles could just see mum smiling in the dark see the white of her face and the, she said yes my darling yes and the man turned in his seat and he reached over and he stroked harry's cheek he looked at Miles. It was Uncle Nick, and Miles wanted to stay awake and listen to the songs on the radio, to be awake when they drove over the mountains so he could see the city, because Mum said the lights of Hobart were really something. She said you could see all the lights of the wharf and all the big tankers and ships, ships that sailed to Antarctica and Argentina and Scandinavia, ships that were as big as factories, but the road was windy, windy 
windy and the headlights were soft and it was so warm and he wanted to say wake me when we get there but he forgot and something pulled tight around his neck and chest and all the bags were falling all the bags were pushing him down everything went quiet and black and then until he heard Harry cry until he heard Harry Miles opened his eyes and it was dark it was night time he sat up and he could see a figure asleep on the chair next to the bed in the glow of the low gray light coming from the hall it was Joe. He was still there. Miles leaned back against the pillow quietly, but Joe opened his eyes. He sat up and grabbed the side of the bed. Are you okay? He said, and he turned on the lamp. Do you need anything? Are you hungry? Miles looked, shook his head. He blinked his eyes against the light. You came back, he said. Joe nodded. He looked down at his hands and let go of the bed. Miles knew they were shaken. The wind was too strong, he said. I couldn't get through the strait. I couldn't leave. And Miles knew it was lucky Joe hadn't been lost out there, too. He was lucky. It was Dad, Miles said, and Joe stood up out of the chair. I know. It's okay. I know what happened. But Miles shook his head. No, he said quietly. Uncle Nick was there. He was in the car. I saw him there, but I forgot. Joe opened his mouth but he didn't speak. He stood for a minute and then he sat back down on the edge of the chair and Miles told him about the crash, what he remembered now, how he opened his eyes again and it was dark and there was no sound, no horn, no headlights but he could see someone was looking down at him. Someone else was there in the car. Dad, he left us there, Miles said. He took Nick away and he didn't come back. And Miles remembered waiting in the dark and in the cold and how he'd called out for mum over and over but she didn't answer she never answered and he was too scared to reach out and touch her he was too scared to move and he found a blanket on the floor and wrapped it up tight around harry and he tried to stay awake they slept on joe's boat miles didn't know what was meant to happen now granddad's house was empty but they moored in close at lady bay and he spent the sunny parts of the day up at the house on the veranda but he liked the boat the way it felt Joe had begun building it when he started his apprenticeship and it had taken a long time. All these years, the wood inside, golden and soft, the galley and the workspaces, the small kitchenette and the bunk beds, all wood, all made by Joe. And here it was waiting to leave again. Miles sat on the bed. Joe was studying a roll of charts at the table taking notes. He was using a ruler to mark out the path he would take to wherever he would, wherever it was he was going, marking out the fastest path away from here. Miles stood up suddenly. I'm coming with you, he said, to the house. Joe looked across at him, his eyes wide. He put his pencil down and leant his hands against the table. Okay, he said. Miles didn't look at anything on the way in the van. He didn't look out the window at the road or the sky or the trees or the river. He just looked at nothing, at his legs and at the inside of the door. He felt sick. It was Harry's funeral on Friday. Friday in the cemetery where mum was buried, where granddad was buried. Lots of people would be there. They would be all crying and they would be saying how terrible it was. Harry wouldn't want these people there. Auntie Jean and the relatives from town and Miles didn't want to see them. He didn't want to think about any of those people. When they pulled up the drive, neither of them moved. They sat in the van for a long time, silent, and Joe's face was still, his eyes tired. Miles watched him stare at the house. What do you think happened to him? He said to Dad. Joe shook his head. I don't know, he said, and he blinked his eyes. I hope he's dead. The door wasn't locked, and the house was quiet and cold, and it smelled of damp. Miles almost expected Dad to be there somehow, sitting in his chair in the gloomy room, sitting there waiting, but he wasn't. There was no one, and it felt like a long time since anyone had been there, since it had been a place where people lived, a place where he had lived. Miles walked over to the framed photograph of Mum on the sideboard and picked it up and took the photo carefully out of the frame. Cloudy, he said, and he knew he was right now. He remembered how Nick had grabbed Mum up and hugged her and how she laughed and how she pushed him away and he didn't know what that meant, if it meant something or nothing, but he wanted to keep it, the photo. He wanted to take it with him. Joe moved close, took the photograph out of his hands and when Miles turned around he could see how much they were the same. Mum and Joe, how much they look the same. Their eyes and the colour of their hair, their skin. Do I look like her, Miles asked. Joe looked down at him and nodded. He handed back the photo. Yes, he said, yes. The bedroom was exactly as it had been. Piled neatly in the corner of the room were Harry's show bags, 
still half full. Harry was always saving everything. Miles let the bag he was stuffing with clothes fall to the floor. We don't have to get everything now, Joe said, and he bent down and picked up the bag. I'll come back tomorrow, okay? Miles sat down on Harry's bed. The doona was cold under his hands and he dug his fists into it. I don't want to go to the funeral, Joe. I'm not going. I don't want to see those people. Auntie Jean and the relatives. I don't even know. I don't want to see them. Joe put the bag down on the bed and his voice soft. Stuart will be there. Kids from school and George. You might regret it. Not going. Not saying goodbye. Miles tried to look at Joe, but his eyes were raw and they wanted to close. There was too much light. I'm staying here, he said, and he felt Joe sit down on the bed. And he was staying. He was going to stay with Harry. Stay here. Joe didn't understand. He didn't know. Harry might come back. Come here. Like Mum. Remember Harry? How Mum came back? She came back sometimes when we couldn't sleep. I know she did. I didn't mean to fall asleep, he said. And the weight of his body gave way. But he felt an arm around him and he felt it tight. Let's just go, Miles. You and me. He listened to Joe talk about all the places they would go. The tropical islands, the clear warm water, the bright lights of new cities, the free open space of ocean. And he knew that Joe was going to take him with him now, wherever he went. He leant his head down against his brother's shoulder and he let himself cry. Miles stood on the deck of Joe's boat and looked out at the water. His eyes moved over it slowly. Carefully, the bay was calm now still and it was hard to believe that the swell had ever been so big, that there had ever been a storm, but Miles could see where it had been. What it had touched, boulders the size of cars, had been pushed over so that the shellfish and plants living safely underneath were now stuck metres above the water, exposed to the sun. Hip high piles of kelp ripped loose from their roots, blacked out on the beach, the whole trees, leaves and all, lay battered and smashed on the rocks. Joe said it had been the biggest swell he had ever seen, Banks that had been working forever were wiped out, gone, the whole coastline had been changed. But the bluff was still there, the reef solid, a tiny swell running on its surface, tiny ripples turning into small lines, little waves beginning to peel and pulling right and wrapping around the reef, waves that could be something as the tide dropped, waves that could be working, light wind, winter sun, it could be something. And Miles could feel it in him, the water. With this board tucked under his arm, his bare feet hit the sand and he ran down the beach. The sun was up high, with the bright blinding white coming off the water and out there. The silhouette of a boy moving, taking into the air, his arms outstretched like an eagle. And even before Miles paddle, paddled up, even before he could see that face, he knew it was Justin Roberts. Unmistakable. Justin out there with his big mouth and his big teeth saying, Give me another one of those. Just give me another one and I'll show you something. Miles let the rip that ran with the bluff carry him. He enjoyed the ride, felt his hands slipping through the cool water, body floating free. And there was the feeling in him like it, when it had been or just been for fun, the water. Him and Justin out there on their foamies. All summer out until dark, ripping on those shories, ripping the life right out of them, wishing that the sun would stay up a little bit longer or just one more, give me one more. Mum would be in the hold and awaiting and honk the horn. Come on, you two. Time to go. Time to get dry. It's dark. And then they'd get in the car with the heater on and they'd be starving. Suddenly starving. They'd drop Justin off and they'd drop Justin home to the stone house over the bluff. See you tomorrow. We'll get some good ones tomorrow. Justin waved and looked him right in the eye. No fear. Long wait between sets, but I thought, stuff it. Not going to get any better today. And that was it, just like always, talking about the water, talking about the waves. Miles noticed the board beneath Justin gleaming. No dings, no wax gorn, brown from grime and sand, just a clean white surface, brand spanking new. Dad got it for me. Have a go if you want. Miles didn't waste a second. He found his leg rope and ripped it loose on a new board, light and sharp. And Miles sat tall and let the first wave roll underneath him. He reached his arms to the sky as it bucked. God, remember this, Justin? The first time we came out to this reef, the first time we made it to the back, we just decided and looked at those waves and said, let's go, let's just go. Hearts racing, saying, yes, come on, it's time now. Ducking under the white water over and over until we, we were shaking, looking out at all the deep water, all the dark water, being scared, 
seeing the face of the reef as the tide rolled back, sitting there where we are right now, like this, right here, remember? When did I forget about this? Miles and Justin fought for the next line, but Miles was all over it. The board fast and loose under his feet and everything was right. It felt good, just like it should. You can give me my stick back now, Justin yelled from behind, but Miles wasn't ready to give this up. Not yet. He paddled out for one more time, just one more. I'm sorry about your brother, Justin said before he walked off, before he walked home. And Miles wanted to say goodbye to tell Justin thanks for everything, for all of it, but he didn't. He just stood and watched and waved as Justin moved down the beach, wet feet shoved into his sneakers. He could feel them, Mum and Harry. They were right there behind him, waiting in the hold and Harry in the front seat, grinning and telling him to hurry up, telling him they were getting fish and chips and he wanted them to stay with him a while longer. He wanted them to stay. He heard the sound of a horn and turned around. It was Joe. Joe was waiting for him. Sometimes in the morning when the mist hovered in the trees and the fog covered the ground and rolled out thick on the water, it meant the winter light would come. And Miles loved that light. It made the dark water sparkle, turn the white spray golden and made the ocean a giant mirror reflecting the sky. Even the leaves on the cracked wattle shone in that light. It made everything come to life and they were going to cloudy. They were leaving and the water was calm and resting and waiting and letting them pass. Just the right amount of wind to sail without having to work hard, without having no to work at all. They moved silently into the bay and through the thinning mist. Cloudy looked brand new, just born, the outlines becoming sharp as the sun rose and the fog cleared, and like a dream, the waking cliffs glowed orange and the sand lit up silver and the sky still pale, violet was full and open. George was there waiting, Jake by his side, standing on the sand it seemed, that none of them needed to talk, that none of them needed words. They walked together to, into the dunes to, place, to a place where the wind couldn't touch and the tide could never reach. Joe knelt down and dug a small hole in the damp sandy soil and they still didn't speak. Even Jake sat quietly. All the things that Harry had left behind scattered on the floor and tucked away in drawers and shoved to the back of his cupboard. His show bags full of lollies that he had tried so hard to save. His red plastic skateboard with bearings rusted solid. His old dirty sneakers. They were just things. They were no use anymore. And when Miles thought about his brother now it was the careful collected shells and rocks and the driftwood and the bones that mattered most. Harry's treasure hunt items that had taken up all the window sills and mantelpieces and the veranda space at Green Dad's. Miles had brought the best ones back to Cloudy. The petrified seahorse, the huge cuttlefish cartridge that Harry had carved his name into and the dried and shrunken Port Jackson shark egg. Although technically Harry hadn't found that one. Not really. Miles combed the dark, dirty layers of caked wax on his board, making lines to give him grip. Harry had made them late because he didn't want to get in the stupid dinghy, and any minute now the sea breeze would pick up and everything would be wrecked. What should I find? Harry asked. Joe was shaking his wet suit out and over, uh, over and over. Um, a cuttlefish bone, a nice bit of driftwood, a shark egg, Miles said. It was just such come out of his mouth and he didn't want to look up because he knew Joe would be staring right at him. He knew he shouldn't have said it. Harry would look everywhere for a shark egg and he'd never look in the right places. He'd never find one. You coming, said Joe. He was already wading out and Harry had gone. He'd run off down the beach. Miles looked out to the water. Perfect three foot glass, empty and waiting till no wind yet. Not yet. And he couldn't believe he was going to give up clean ways for this, for Harry, but he was going two he'd already put his board down on the sand he watched harry move into the dunes god he wasn't gonna find much in there if there were eggs anywhere they'd be up near the whalebone point the current pushed loose stuff up there anything that floated and it had just been a full moon there was a chance a small chance miles poured a cup of tea into the thermos lid warmed his hands he stayed out in the water for ages there had been time after all plenty the water just for him did you look over there for an egg, Harry? Miles pointed to the rock pools and gnarled roof that made up Whalebone Point. Harry was stuffing his face with a fat slice of Auntie Jean's carrot cake. I looked everywhere, he said, white butter icing stuck to his lips. Are you sure you looked over there? Harry just stared at him and then looked, took another bite of cake. Miles walked over to his towel and pulled the Port Jackson egg shot out from under it. He threw it at Harry. It landed on the sand right near his feet. 
and Harry looked at it for a long time. He didn't even chew. Is the shark out of it, he said finally. Miles nodded. The brown covering of the egg had spiralled open, its contents long gone. But I didn't find it. You would have if you looked over there properly. Harry put the remaining bit of cake down. He touched the egg with his fingers, held it up to the light. Yes, he nodded. Thanks, he said. Joe touched his arm. The sun had moved in and the sky and time had run on. Time had gotten away. Miles bent down and put the shark egg in the hole. He put the seahorse in too, but kept the cuttlefish tight in his hand. He'd hang on to it. He'd take it with them. Just one thing. Joe filled the hole. He patted it solid and marked the spot with shells they had collected on the way through to the dunes. Old shells, white and ancient shells that had been at Cloudy forever. It was time to go. Joe shook George's hand goodbye and when Miles went to do the same, George grabbed him a quick and pulled him in tight. Don't look back, he said in his way, so that all the words ran together, but Miles understood and he knew he wouldn't come back here. Not for a long time. Then George put something in his hand, something small and cold and sharp against his skin. The white pointer's tooth come back to him. In his mind, he saw Uncle Nick get in the car. He leant over and stroked Harry's cheek. He looked at Miles. This is for you, he said, and he put the tooth in his hands. For luck. Miles looked up at George and his eyes full of tears. You found him, he said. Harry? And George nodded. Yes, he said softly. Jake barked and George waved goodbye as they set off in the dinghy and headed out to the boat. Miles looked back down the curved wide beach of Cloudy one last time out of all the places and all the cliffs and all the rocks and all the black water and all the good waves rushing this place was the only one he would miss. Cloudy was special always brighter and Harry was free to stay here now free to run along the beach until the end of time. Out past the shallows past the sandy bottom bays comes the dark water black and cold and roaring and rolling out an invisible path a new line for them to follow, to somewhere warm, to somewhere new. Oh, and that is the end of our story. Thanks for reading with me.